everyone. Welcome to Trout in the Classroom. My name is Alicia Miller and I work for St. Croix County Resource Management Division and I am the moderator for today's uh, session. And I am excited to have Greenwood Elementary School, Mr. Pop's fourth grade class, and someone from the Trout Limited named Greg Olson, who are working with the Trout in the Classroom project. And our fourth graders are really excited to share with you what they've been working on today. Um, a few um, notes is uh, if you have a question, please type it in the chat box that is on the right hand side of your computer screen. There is a sessions tab, click in the sessions tab first, and then click on the chat button um, and type it in there. And then I will let um, people know when there's a question. Um, and the session is being recorded and will be permanently made available on the Wild Rivers Conservancy YouTube account. So um, you probably want to stay on chat and not go out to video. Um, and if you have any other questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and I will um, let our classroom take over with their presentation. Thank you so much, Alicia. Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Pop, and I'm a fourth grade teacher at Greenwood Elementary School, and we are so excited to have you with us today. And I'm going to share my screen and we will get things started. Um, thank you, Greg, for being here. Thank you, Alicia, for being here. Again, thank you all for being here. Uh, let me make sure I got this. Hopefully everybody can see the screen. And I'm going to go ahead and start our slideshow. So <clears throat> our session today is Trout in the Classroom. And it's a combination between Greenwood Elementary School, um, the CIAP T Wish chapter of Trout Unlimited, and the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. I would say that this is kind of a combination presentation. Obviously, we have our trout in the classroom, but we've expanded it to go beyond just raising trout in our room. And my students, fourth grade students, will tell you uh, an awful lot about that here in the next hour. So. Um, to get things started here, uh, Ms. Crystal is going to talk to us about what it is we're raising. Go ahead, Crystal. We're, we're raising brown trout. Um, a couple characteristics are that the tails have almost no spots, but the dor dorsal fins have a lot of spots, and the dorsal fins on the fins on top of the trout. So th this right here is what you'd consider a dorsal fin along the top, and that does have spots? Yep. Okay, and the tail is right back here, and it has zero spots, or? If there's any spots at all, there's very few. And is that at the bottom of the tail or the top of the tail? Towards the top of the Towards tail. Towards the tip of the tail, and then it's pretty cool. Awesome. So we're raising brown trout, and they're also known for what? Their large black, large black spots. Yeah, that you can kind of see in this beauty taken right here. Uh, and it uh, looks like some kind of screen. Okay, thank you so much, Crystal. Uh, next up, we have Spencer and Brody are going to talk to us about the life cycle of a brown trout. So, gentlemen. Uh, the life cycle of a brown come on up, Spence. Uh, the life cycle of a brown trout starts with spawning. Spawning happens between November and February. A female digs a nest and releases eggs. The male fertilizes the eggs and the gravel. Thank you. So the, the spawning, they need that gravel. I'd like you to pay attention to that. That gravel for the spawning bed is a pretty important feature here for trout. So once they uh, spawn, next I think we're going to be talking about the eggs, right? Mm -hmm. Does that sound right, Brody? All right, Mr. Brody, tell us about eggs. Okay, Steve, can yeah. you hear your kids talk a little bit louder? Yep, we'll have them come a little bit closer here. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So Brody, why don't you tell us about the um, eggs? Are we... Oh, sorry. So they lay their eggs. Spencer was talking about that. Brody's going to talk about the Alvins. Go ahead. Alvin stay in the gravel. Move up the yield sack. Emerge as a fry and set up territories. Mm -hmm. They grow into a par. Thank you so much, Brody. So Brody's talking about once the eggs hatch, they develop into what's called albins, which are like mini fish, but they have uh, almost like an egg yolk sac, which you can kind of see in this picture here. We've got a better one coming up down the road. But those albins, they don't need to eat food at that point. They're kind of consuming that um, yolk sac as they're developing and growing. So from that, they turn into par. Why don't you talk about that, Spencer? Come on up. Uh, par 
Tyler are very territorial. As we sit in our tank, uh, they go eating each other. And um, they're called par because when their yolk sac is fully absorbed, they then pull them back. Yeah, so their diet needs change when they absorb that yolk sac. And what we have in our tank, we get them from egg to alvin stage and into uh, par stage. So, and last but not least, Brody was going to talk about adult trout. Want to go ahead and hit that, Brody? Adult trout live in deeper water that gives them shelter and safety from predators and enough food to survive. In the winter, they migrate upstream to spawn. They live five to 20 years. Thank you very much, Brody. So as those trout grow, their nutrition needs grow and they're able to handle deeper water and utilize more of the stream. So that's a little bit of information on the life cycle of a brown trout. Thank you, gentlemen. So as we're talking about the life cycle of a trout and how to identify a trout, we thought it might be important to try to figure out how you can identify a male trout from a female trout, especially as a trout fisherman. That's always kind of fun. Did you catch a boy or a girl? So Manny's gonna to talk to us about that. Go ahead, Manny. The difference between the male and the female adult brown trout is that the male trout has a puff jaw and the female have um, the female has like a rounded nose. So if we take a look at the picture here, the one on top would be a male because it has that this is a, a mature male. It has a more pointed and that hook in the bottom jaw. Where if you look at the female, it's more rounded. Okay, that's fantastic, Manny. What else can you tell us about how you could identify a male from a female? Um, the male's color on its belly is a golden brown color, and it's different from the females. Because the females is more what? White. Yeah, so again, this is a good illustration here of a more golden belly with the hook jaw versus a more pale underside. So as you're out there angling, and I'll even go back to what Crystal was saying, you can notice on both those dorsal fins, you can see the spots. And on the tail, you can see spots on the top of the tail, but the rest of it's pretty clear. Thanks very much, Manny. Appreciate it. Uh, Caleb and Beckham, unfortunately, can't be with us here today, but they've been doing some research on what is it that trout eat. And so here's a couple of slides that uh, they put together. Go ahead, Caleb. Come on up. They, they're similar to the size of... Small plants and the larger ones eat small mice that fall into the water. The trout we have in the classroom are eating each other and the special food that we provide for them. In the wild, trout eat smaller trout, bugs, mice, other fish, and probably lizards if they are small or if they fall into the water. So our class has been pretty fascinated with our trout. Uh, we're feeding them kind of a protein mix. If you think of dog food, like little pellets, and then they chop that fine, like they almost put it into a coffee grinder. So when we feed them, it's almost like little pinches of sand, and that's what they're eating. But if they're hungry enough, uh, the one indicator you need to feed them a little more is they'll start to attack each other because they are predatory. And um, that's been something that's been kind of fascinating, hasn't it? So talk to us, what are some of these insects here that you chose to put on here? Well, mainly what trout eats is in the water, and trout will eat flies if you get too close to the water or if they're on the water. The reason the trout are eating each other is because they can't find food or if it's easier or if it is easier for them. The fish will eat crayfish, worms, ticks, water creatures, insects, midges, helmet, and stonefly. Amongst many other things as well. So I wanted to pay attention to this uh, thing you said that, again, from a fishing angler standpoint, Trout eat 90% 90, 90 of their diet. They're, they're feeding in the water, underneath the water, on these small aquatic invertebrates and what have you. And only about 10% of their diet comes from things that are slurping at the surface. Is that correct? All right, thank you. So, again, they'll eat anything from a midge to a mouse, depending upon their, their size. And, of course, we've unfortunately had a couple of big trout eating their siblings. So, <laughs> um, next we have... Um, Mr. Ashlyn wants to talk about how long we're raising the trout in our classroom. Come on up, Ash. We got the, the fish at the fish, hat, fish hatchery in November, at November 10th, and we will re release them around Memorial Day at like 
May 27th. Yeah, May 27th. So it'll be 200 day, about 200 days that we are raising the check. Yeah, and this year in particular, typically, and Greg, you can tell me if, if this is right. We usually have been getting our trout in years passed after the new year. So we'll get them in early January and we raise them into May as soon as the weather kind of cooperates. And I mean, we want to be hiking on a nice sunny day, not on a wet April snowy gross day. So uh, typically it's about five months that we'll raise them. But this year we got them in early November. So they're getting big. <laughs> it's been kind of yeah. Uh, you're, you're right, Steve. We used to get them from a private hatchery and kind of their time scale was uh, their brown trout were uh, spawning uh, right around the first of the year. Mm -hmm. and now that we've uh, gone to getting them from the uh, state hatchery, they have a, uh, the, their, their fish are spawning in uh, mid-November. So. Yeah, and I, I have to tell you, the quality of the eggs that we've got this year from the hatchery have been fantastic. So I'm really glad we made that move. So Great. All right, thank you. Speaking of the fish hatchery, Zoe is going to tell us a little bit about that experience. We had a pretty nice field trip to go and explore the fish hatchery. Go ahead, Zoe. So these concrete um, walls here are called runs, fish runs, and this was at the St. Clay Falls hatchery and we received eggs and each run fish run has an age class yeah so i think this might have been one year old fish in this run and two year old fish on another and then smaller fish it was they had runs everywhere and they had brown trout they had brook trout and i can't remember did they have rainbows do you remember i think they had at least like one or two yeah i think they had brooks and browns at the fish hatchery which any of you can visit anytime it's really kind of a neat place Thanks, Zoe. And then this one, so in the last picture, you can see when they spawn. So after they spawn, so this, what is this room here? That's inside the fish hatchery. Yeah, this is the, the egg incubation room, right? Mm -hmm. And then what is, what is this here? The one that, um, they're called Alvin's. Mm -hmm. And in the last picture, the Mr. Pop was talking about they need to eat that own sack on them. Yeah, they consume that, yep. Yeah, that was that picture I was hoping to see when Spencer and, and Brody were talking. You can get a better picture of those little egg sacks. They almost look like little Buddha bellies or something on the bottom there. They're pretty cool. We did not get them at this stage, though, did we? No. we what stage were did we get the... They were, like, they were in this stage. Which is? Um, eggs? Eggs, yep, absolutely. Eggs. And then in the big picture, it's called an incubator, and we received 5,000 plus eggs. Well, we didn't receive 5,000. They figured there's at least 5,000 in the egg incubator here. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? Yeah. Okay. And in the incubator, there's water running through it because if there wasn't any water, they would get smushed. And they would have, they get too, the temperature would get too warm, I thought. So. And the black dots are their eyes and you can see how they're developing yeah as your eggs are getting closer and closer to hatching you'll see them go from this almost clear uh, to you'll start to see the outlines of the bodies and the eyes um, and how do you know if a egg is not going to hatch what do you look for uh their orange sack is like a milky white mm -hmm. they get real clouded you can't kind of see through it so you know that those eggs were unsuccessful Thanks, Zoe. That's great. And then, oh, one more thing. This was kind of neat at the fish hatchery, too. Um, so this fish was blue, and it was actually a trout, and it was in the... It was with two-year-olds, I think. Two-year-olds, and the reason why it was in the two-year-old class is because um, if it was in the five-year-old class, he would get, like, picked on and maybe eaten. Right. So this blue trout had a genetic defect. It doesn't have the ability to reproduce. And what it happens naturally, it's just kind of a genetic freak incident. And it's a fully functional fish, but uh, it would have been picked on by its tank mates. So they make sure to put it in with smaller fish so it can stay alive. And they kind of treat these as pets. I think they said they had one that lasted 12 years. Um, and this one in here, I think, is five years old. If I, does that sound right, kids? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Zoe. Uh, next, we've got Maddie, who's going to talk about what happens after we raise the trout. So come on up, Maddie.
We we stopped the chat in the Royal River because the chat is struggling to naturally reproduce. So. Yeah. You want to talk any more about that? No. Okay. So the trout that we're releasing are about this size. They end up being roughly three inches. Some of them get a little bit bigger, some a little bit smaller, but three to four inches is the range, which is kind of cool because the, the eggs are about the size, a little smaller than your pinky fingernail. And to go from that to three inches is a pretty neat transformation. And again, we are stocking in the Willow River, and you're going to talk a little more about the Willow right now. Actually, it was too slow moving, and it was too long for the trout. And downstream, it picks up the speed, and there are springs that pull the water down to the top. Yeah, so the Willow River used to be a naturally reproducing river, but due to soil erosion, there's too much sediment, and it's too slow moving on the upstream side for there to be a lot of natural. Remember how we talked about they need gravel uh, beds to lay their eggs in? Uh, there may be trout in the upper willow, but it um, the eggs, any eggs that would be deposited, most likely get covered by silt and sand, and they never hatch. But downstream, it's getting better. Mr. Pop? Yes. What defines where, is there like a breakoff point for the upstream versus downstream parts of the river? Oh, on the willow, boy. Greg, maybe you can help me a little more. I always consider it um, near County Road A and County Road E. Um, uh, just between outside of Burkhart. So everything above Burkhart, I consider the upstream side and everything below Burkhart is the downstream side. Does and what, right? happens, what happens on the river right there? Uh, well, it, there's, you see this picture here of the waterfalls. If you ever get the opportunity to visit Willow River State Park, it's a, if you go from the beach area to the falls, it's a beautiful 40 minute hike and it's, it, it drops and there's a lot of, um, you'll, you can stand in water that's warmer and then you'll see the springs kind of coming in and it's a significant temp difference um, as it makes its way down. Yeah, and I, I agree with you, Steve. I mean, it's kind of arbitrary, you know, <laughs> there's well, no dividing line, but yeah, if, uh, I would agree with your assessment. And pretty much the upper part is more uh, you know, meadow type farmland um, area, whereas downstream it's it's going through the park, it, it's going through forest. It uh, picks up some a bit of a gradient uh, mm -hmm. compared to the upper. But, yeah, right. But they do stocking both above that spot and below that spot. If I'm understanding that right, too. So the DNR yeah. does. All right, Maddie. Anything else to add? Oh, sure. Um, when the brown trout get stocked, they're really uh, and, and then they get 18 to 20 inches long. The Wisconsin DNR select rivers in Wisconsin regularly. Correct. And so if you're driving along and see a DNR truck looking like this and you got a fishing rod, uh, you can have a pretty fun time because uh, they are out. I mean, they deliver almost weekly, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what we understand? And what's going on in this picture right here, Maddie? Um, Mr. Pops, class a couple of years ago, was putting on this guy. Yep. After our few months of raising the trout, we deliver them, and we're on the lower part of the river where we deposit our fish, and we'll be doing that again on May 27th. Thank you very much, Maddie. Yeah. So uh, a couple questions were how many eggs do we start with, and Charlie and Mila are going to talk about that. Come on up, girls. So we started with 250, but we lost 12, which means we'll probably have that much when we release them because... Chungus, Big Bill, and Big Boy got released because they're eating other siblings. Why don't you tell us a little bit? So, yeah, they named a couple of the trout. Here's Chungus and Big Bill and Big Boy in a styrofoam bucket. They got released a little early. How did we know that they were causing trouble, Charlie? Um, because um, Come on after, up. Like, after specials and recess, um, we would come in and we would see those three big ones, one of the three big ones with um, a trout um, tail in their mouth. And then like, while we were learning, we would also see that they would go after one of them and get some. Yeah, you could, they kind of picked their spots in the tank and would go after any trout that kind of came near them. And boy, we had some pretty interesting, some heightened emotion when we came in and you'd see a fish there with a tail kind of flipping like this. Uh, so we released them a little bit early. Thank you very much, girls. We started with 250. 
three of our eggs didn't hatch. They became kind of opaque, like what um, Zoe was saying. Um, and then we don't know how many fish Chungus, Big Bill, and uh, Big Boy ate, but it was we. I'll tell you this, we'd come in every couple of days and look like, well, I feel like we have less fish. And we never saw the bodies, and then we started seeing the tails. So. Yeah, and some of them make a trip, but most likely, we'll have to that one. So most likely, we'll have 238 fish on the waist. Right. So one thing that we were make note of is in the wild it, trout that are hatched to only about five percent of the eggs will reach mature adulthood and a lot of them get eaten as eggs as alvin as par uh, at any number of time they're i mean they're free game so that's why they need that protection we're giving a good number even if we've lost 50 of our eggs it's a higher success rate than if they were to be found in the wild greg can, does that sound right to you Yep. Yep. Correct. So I don't know if we'll have 238. We'll probably have between 150 and 200, but uh, our fish are healthy and that's been pretty good. Thank you so much, girls. Um, outside of just raising trout in the classroom, we've also been doing some service learning and Lily is going to talk to us about why we're raising trout. Come on over, get a little closer, Lil. We are raising trout to stop the Willow River, but we are improving habitat on the Connect River. We went on a field trip on the Connect Connect River and we removed invasive backbone and back bubble that was in the riverbed. That will make it hard for the trout to reproduce. The invasive backbone and back cell that weakened the banks of the Willow River, so it is hard for the fish to reproduce. All right, so why don't you talk to us a little bit more about what's happening in this set of pictures here? So, in the corner um, is me and my mom at Sash and Burn. And the top of that picture is um, kids throwing sticks and branches of buckthorn and buck to the fire pit. That's right. And so the trout we're releasing uh, are not naturally, uh, there's not a very high population of naturally reproducing trout in the willow, although that's improving. Um, we are fortunate enough to have the Kinnikinnick River here in River Falls, right in our backyard. And this is another thing that Greg and the folks, Randy at uh, Trout Unlimited, have done. So their volunteers have come out to cut buckthorn and box elder. And the last couple of years, our students have come out for a service learning day to pick up the brush and have big burn piles. And we typically have hot dogs that day and over a campfire and hot chocolate and the likes. And um, it's kind of neat because the kids have an opportunity to get in their backyard and to come back and see the improvements. And do you want to talk at all about why buckthorn again was a problem? Um, it pushes it pushes soil into the river and it turns into mud, which covers up the gravel. So the eggs that were already laid there cannot hatch because they're covered with so much mud. Right, we're pretty lucky with the Kinnikinnick River that it's a naturally reproducing trout stream. It's it's got a healthy stream bed, um, but it's under threat, like with that box elder and the buckthorn. Um, the root systems are shallow, and so that impacts the riparian corridor more and more of those trees sprout up uh, they're pretty aggressive so the trout unlimited folk volunteers have been cutting it back and treating it to allow more native prairie grasses which have a far deeper root system which strengthens uh, the river banks which again makes better habitat for trout and invertebrates and other organisms to live thank you so much lily Speaking of Lily, here's Lily, and now we're going to talk about um, what kind of equipment you have to have to raise trout in your classroom. As you can see, um, I'm doing the chair, and it looks like that. Um, and we trap, and we have it so it tries to keep the tank at a decent temperature. What kind of temperature range are we talking about, Lily? Um, 52 to 55 degrees. Right. And it acts like kind of a refrigerator, right? And it's kind of noisy. So if you do have trout in the classroom, that chiller makes some, it's pretty constant noise. It's got an intake valve. So a pump will push water in through the chiller and it'll cool it off and put it out through the out valve and puts it right back into the tank. But it's a pretty necessary because trout are super sensitive to temperature. Thanks, Lil.
And of course, uh, a chiller is really good, but it does you no good if you don't have any place to put your water. And so, Sarah, come on over here by the camera. Uh, this is a tank. It's a semi-gallon tank, which is basically the same thing we have here, except this tank has a little stand on for it, and ours is just sitting on the countertop. Yeah, it's a pretty big tank. It's about three and a half feet wide and at least a good 18, 20 inches tall. And again, it takes how much water? 75 gallons. 75 gallons. Now, we've had as many as 400 eggs hatched in a year, um, which we had a lot more fish kill. Um, it was a little more difficult to manage. And the 250 seems to be kind of that sweet spot. Um, our charter bin are handling it all very, very well. And outside of the tank, you were also going to talk about another piece of equipment. The bubbler. The bubbler, also known as an aerator. Talk to us about that. Um, the bubbler. Yeah. Well, this is a picture of the bubbler. The airstone bubbler keeps a steady stream of air, which contains oxygen flowing into the water, allowing the natural bacterial filtration to take place, without starving the fish of oxygen. The humans. Fish and other aquarium life forms require ample supply of oxygen to thrive. Yeah, and so if you're a trout angler or a fish angler, if you can find places where the water's churning over and getting frothy, like near that waterfall and whatnot, uh, the trout love, and so do the insects, they love that richly oxygenated water. It's a great place to search for fish. So, and in our tank, that bubbler's running all the time. So, thank you so much, Sarah. All right. Um, Aubrey couldn't make it today, but she was doing research on another important piece, which is a filter. And here's a picture of our filter. It's two little like mesh bags that have uh, coal in them. And we change them about every month. Here we got a couple of boys that are changeable. And you can maybe see how dirty and filthy it is. So we replaced the uh, with a clean, um, I don't know, it's kind of cottony. Uh, with, and you can see this silver package has the charcoal in it, and then we close it back up and slide it back in. And the pump uh, pushes water through the filter, and that takes care of a lot of the garbage, debris, and, and bio waste that happens whenever you have a fish tank. Um, so that's Aubrey's. And the other thing she wanted to talk about was the water. You can't have a fish tank, a chiller, and all that without water. And we use filtered water to fill our 75 gallons. I went to our local grocery store and I ponied up about 20 bucks to buy a couple of these big um, tubs that are containers that handle about five gallons. And we get purified water that goes through reverse osmosis. We found that it, it um, really helps with some of our levels that we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, we do have to fill water every month or so. I put in about five gallons so that we lose from evaporation and et cetera. If you use tap water, it's got all sorts of nasty chemicals that are good for us as people, but um, trout are super sensitive to it. So we like that clean filtered water. Speaking of uh, managing the water, Lewis is gonna talk to us about pH. Come on in, Lewis. Come on up by the camera, bud. pH is important because it is telling you if the trout are healthy or not. We really want the trout to be we really want the pH to be yellow. If it is too high or low acidification, it means that there is too much toxic acid in the fish. Right, and so seven is a perfect pH, right? Yeah. And it's really hard to maintain a perfect seven. Um, what is ours here? I'll, I'll flip it, but mm -hmm. here's a, a picture of Lewis taking a sample of pH in a little vial. How many milliliters do we use? Uh, five. Yeah, five milliliters, and then you can see this little color chart here. That's after you put in your drops. Uh, then we measure um, what the pH is. And what is our tank then sitting around? Uh, 7.4. Right. And as long as your pH is consistent, it can be a little high or it can be a little low. Um, the trout just don't like huge swings and variations. So as long as you're consistent, they tend to be okay. But the closer you can get to that 7, the better. All right. Thanks, Lou. Next up, we have Mr. Zachary. He's going to talk to us about... Ammonia, another thing we look for in our tank. Ammonia is a poison that ah. kills fish, and ammonia is a less poison for fish. Ammonia is also known as NH3. NH3 is the most toxic nitrogenous waste 
found in the aquarium and is capable of killing fish or causing them to be diseased. It is produced by the breakdown of organic materials and by the fish themselves as a byproduct of their metabolism. Metabolism, right. So ammonia, I mean, fish go to the bathroom and you can pollute the water again. That's why changing your filter is a pretty important thing. But we measure that because any spike in ammonia can make the fish pretty sick. And once they get sick, it, it's tough to get them healthy again. Thanks so much, Zach. And again, we take the measurements just like Lewis did for pH. And again, we go back and look at the chart um, and see kind of how it fits on the ammonia. But our, we've had zero ammonia problems this year, haven't we? All right, good job. All right, next up we have Reese who's going to talk to us about nitrates. That's okay. Uh, the nitrates help us see the college perch and healthy or not. If there, there are no nitrates, it is good for our trout because that means they are healthy. If there are a lot of nitrates, that means our trout are not healthy. <clears throat> And they can get pretty sick, can't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, we take measurements just like the others. And how have our nitrates been? Oh, really good. Yeah, we've had like zero. But I can tell you from raising trout for five, I think this is our fifth year of doing trout in the classroom. The worst fish kill we had was due to a very fast nitrate spike. I we came in one day and noticed like three or four fish lying dead on the ground on the you know on the bottom of the tank, and I pick them up, and it was three or four one day, and then it was ten, and then it was fifteen. And we took the measurement. We had gone from zero nitrate parts to a bunch. So, and it took us a good week and a half before we could get the tank back under control and, and uh, things stabilized. So, um, again, how do you fix your tank if it's high on pH, if it's spiking ammonia or spiking nitrates? It's getting that good water that we talked about and replacing water. That's the best thing that we have found in our classroom. Thanks, Reese. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to turn things over here to Greg, who's going to talk about how Trout Unlimited has really helped us a lot to get situated here. Okay. I, I'm Thanks, Steve. Uh, first off, I'd like to give a shout out to your uh, entire class. Great, great job so far. I've learned a lot. Awesome presenters. And in general, your, your entire class does a great job raising these trout every year. So keep it up, guys. Great job. Um, so Trout in the Classroom has been around for 30 plus years now. It um, started out in the, in the Northeast uh, United States. Um, it reaches 100,000 plus kids annually uh, across the United States. Um, pr promotes hands-on STEAM learning almost year round. You know, now it's November through May. You know, there's the obvious uh, environmental aspects of this project, but you know, uh, I've seen from Steve's class, uh, I've seen artwork, uh, I've seen uh, writing, uh, um, you know, they're, they're using math to calculate different things, you know, of course, the chemistry, the kids are showing the water chemistry stuff, and it's great, you know, they've got this kind of wor real world application, uh, for, you know, for all these things that, uh, you know, you might not get all of a textbook all the time, so. Um, the, we're, we're not trying to make fisher folk uh, with this program at all. I mean, that's not what it's about at all. It's uh, We're trying to promote a new generation of advocates for environmental stewardship. Um, and we hope that when it comes time to vote or speak out on environmental issues, uh, you know, Steve's kids, they'll, they'll, they'll remember what they, what they learned, you know, and they they've, are caring for a very fragile species that needs extremely uh, a clean environment and uh, they're, ra they're raising this uh, these brown trout from an egg i mean it's it's a great experience right. um our chapter is the kayak to wish the local chapter uh covering saint croix uh, pierce and polk counties uh, we currently sponsor nine trout in the classroom programs we have uh one at Greenwood, of course, uh, in Rocky Branch, also in River Falls. We have uh, two in Amory, one in Hammond, Ellsworth, Prescott, Glenwood City, and Hudson. Uh, our chapter provides funding for the setup. Uh, if the school doesn't have it, 
it's, it usually runs about uh, $1,500 um, to, to buy everything. The, the biggest cost is the chiller. Uh, chiller and the filter and the aquarium are, are probably the biggest cost. Um, and then, you know, we, we also, sometimes the school doesn't have the funding for the field trip and, and we'll, we'll take care of that too. Um, our chapter also provides volunteers for um, bugs in the classroom. We are lucky to have a U of M entomologist, Dean Hansen, in our chapter. Just does a phenomenal job. I mean, he, he's so into it. I mean, he'll bring in uh, all these different uh, species of aquatic insects and the kids get to you know, have hands-on time with them and uh, identify them. And that's pretty cool because during the trout release field trip, at Willow River State Park, Dean also comes out there, and we're collecting bugs right from the stream, uh, and uh, the kids then take what they learned earlier in bugs in the classroom, and they, and they can they do a great job identifying uh, bugs in the wild setting as, as well. So, um, yeah, I mean our our chapter volunteers have a great time with that. Uh, Steve also show. I mean Steve's classroom takes it a step further and has kind of a, a service day and he showed the uh, buckthorn and um, box elder removal so uh, like I said we, we, we just, our chapter has a blast uh, doing it and, and glad to sponsor it um, so how can your class get involved so if you have a classroom or you know you want to take this or have a you know child and uh, you want to take this uh, idea to your um, uh, child's uh, teacher and uh, you happen to be in the area of course <laughs> but uh, yeah let, let, let us know if you're interested uh, prefer preferably by the end of the previous school year so if you were interested um, in doing this uh, next November I mean uh, let me know uh, quite soon uh, you can reach me at uh, Greg Olson at uh, driftless23 at gmail.com. I will uh, contact our local DNR fisheries biologist in Baldwin, Casey Yali, and I will ask her permission to stock fish. Um, and she has not turned us down yet, but um, get, we got to check. We got to get her permission. Uh, then I'll contact DNR, the DNR in Madison for all the uh, uh, permits. We're trying to streamline that project right now. Steve's class is registered as a fish farm, actually. Um, and, you know, all, along with all these other big operations in the state. But like I said, we're, we're trying, hopefully for next year, we, we kind of do away with that. But for now, uh, anyway, Steve doesn't have to worry about it. We take care of it. Um, and then we get, we, uh, get equipment ordered for the start of the, of the uh, new school year. We did have some issues uh, with that uh, this past year, uh, getting uh, Glenwood City uh, going. That was a new program. Just, you know, with everything else, uh, there seems to be a shortage of everything, including chillers. Who, who knew? But um, so earlier the better, I guess. Um, and then uh, Steve's class already touched on it. Uh, we get the eggs in, in mid-November. Mid from the uh, hatchery, and then we do the bugs in the program, uh, bugs in the classroom program, usually between uh, somewhere in April and May time frame, and then the uh, fryer released at Willow River State Park, generally sometime in May toward the, the end of the school year. Steve, I think you're muted if you're talking. That's funny that I got muted. All right, thanks, Greg. Thanks so much. Um, I'll go back to the share. And just lastly, how does this fit into our curriculum? You already touched on it. Um, you know, boy, having Dr. Dean, I just want to say he's amazing. Uh, he's coming to our class on May 2nd. My students' eyes got huge when they learned that they're going to get to play with all these different insects. And I'm telling you, you're going to have crayfish crawling on you, helgramites and midges and studs and caddis and all sorts of really neat neat things you can find in the river and when we go and release our trout uh in may on the 27th those students would spend the entire day in the river if, if we'd let them just digging and pulling up on the bank and trying to sort things they it's really a neat experience 
But how does it fit into our curriculum? Well, it really, that word stewardship really grips me. So connecting with your local watersheds and your local ecosystems and going in your backyard and seeing what's out there and knowing that decisions you make have an impact for the better or for worse, I think is really important. Obviously, there's plenty of great science and experimentation you can do between water quality, learning about the riparian corridor um, and enhancing it. Math, we do a lot with graph work. Uh, doing research for putting this presentation together, I'm having them research, read about trout and write about things and reflect upon it. And in particular at Greenwood Elementary, this is a great reflection of character education, that service learning that we do, being good citizens, being good stewards, it really fits in well with uh, our mission here at Greenwood and at River Falls. So that's kind of our presentation. Alicia, if there are any questions, I'm gonna hit the stop share. Um, we're happy to try to uh, answer any questions. Well, I had a question, which was, um, how often do you take those chemical measurements in your classroom? When we're doing really well, it's almost every Friday, but I think every other week is more accurate. So this year it's been about every other week. Okay. And let's see here. I'm trying to think if there are, ooh, what, what are your students' favorite parts about the, let's stick to the classroom part of it. What's the favorite part about the classroom part? Come on up, Madeline has an answer for that. Come on, Zoe. Okay. Um, probably. Measuring. You like taking the measurements? Yeah. Okay. And what do you like, Zoe? Um, mine is like when we see the trout like um swim and then when they go close to them, they like go up and they think we're feeding them. And it's kind of funny. Yeah, they learn pretty fast. If they see someone walk by, they all go swimming up and they're ready to be fed right at the surface. Yeah. What do you got, Charlie? Yeah, that so just viewing them and seeing them come towards you, kind of neat. Thanks, and let's do Ashlyn here quick. I, I like feeding them, it's very funny when they just come up. They get pretty aggressive, don't they? Yeah, it's a big like food fiesta. But uh, yeah, they part of our business called in the classroom is um, when you feed them, it's like a fight to eat three times. Okay. And we got about four more. I hope that's okay. That's totally fine. My favorite part about raising the trout is just raising them in general. Yeah. It is kind of neat having them here. They're kind of like little visitors. Go ahead, Caleb. Um, my favorite part um, is maybe you seen the picture. He likes seeing them attack each other. I like, I like seeing the fish get into fights at the bottom. Fights at the and bottom? The mm -hmm. They really are territorial. Even in these little things, they'll like push each other around to get to the best spots. They're kind of bossy. Yeah. Oh, they're doing it now. Okay. All right. We got a couple more. Go ahead, Zach. Um, so my favorite thing is when the trout take cover from the bigger trout. Um, you can actually see the smaller ones hide under the big rocks, and the big ones can't go under and hide. Yeah, they're pretty quick, aren't they? Yes, and it's a very fun experience. Very cool. And Reese, what, come on up. What's your favorite part? I just like watching them. You just like watching them. All right. Thank you, kids. Well, wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Pop and Mr. Olson and all you fourth graders. That was a wonderful presentation. We really enjoyed it. Um, for those of you who are sticking around for our the next presentation or the next concurrent session, it will start in 10 minutes at 1.30. I guess it's more like 14 minutes. And so you have a few minutes here if you need to go take a break, go to the bathroom, get a drink. And um, then our afternoon sessions will be starting at 1.30. You could also use this time to go check out the expo. Um, people won't be in there, but you can still see their websites and things like that too, if you're interested. All right, thank you so much, Greg. Thank you so much, Alicia, and thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.